Welcome to the Book Hackers Podcast. I'm Cindy Manier. I'm Tammy Crin, and we are the co-founders of the Book Hackers Club. If you're listening to this, you probably are a self-publisher who's ready to grow your business, and that's exactly why we're here. What is a book hacker, you ask? A book hacker is a self-publisher who is growing their business by creating books that provide value for their target audience while building a sustainable business. We'll cover marketing, branding, sales, and everything in between. If you're ready to fast track the growth of your self-publishing business, you've come to the right place. Our goal is simple, to help you think and act like an entrepreneur. Every Thursday, we'll share tips and resources designed to help you master all aspects of your self-publishing business while having fun along the way. Ready? Let's start. Welcome to the Book Hackers Show. Today, we are interviewing Thea Newcomb live on Clubhouse. I'm Cindy Manier from Adudu Book Creator. Tammy, why don't you introduce yourself and then Thea can introduce herself. Sounds great. Well, welcome everybody. I'm Tammy Crin. I am the founder of e for B2B, which is Kendall Direct Publishing for Business. So I help people create brand of books for their business and teach people how to do that. Okay, Thea, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Thea. I'm a Glasgow-based Californian. I'm a trainer, blogger, book publisher, and Scotland's only Canva expert, which we'll be talking a little bit about later on today. All right, let's get started. First of all, Thea, we, I know you're a Californian who is now in Scotland. You want to tell us a little bit about how you came to move to the UK? Yeah, it's kind of funny. So my first ever trip to the UK was in 1987. I came over on one of those college abroad, you know, semester abroad things. Oh, I forget what they call it. But anyway, 1987, I came over with a college. I was going to De Anza College in Cupertino, home of Apple Computers, which is where I lived at the time. And I loved the UK. I've always been kind of an Anglophile, really interested in music, especially from the UK. And so a few years later, I then came back in, in 89 for five weeks before I finished off my degree. My degree was in communications, and I graduated from Sonoma State University, not far from where Tammy used to live. And a year later, I ended up taking a trip. No, in fact, I beg your pardon. It was that same year that I graduated. I took a trip to London. And when I landed... I got denied entrance and they stuck me in quarantine because they're like, we think you're going to stay here. And they went through my file of facts and they went and called numbers in the file of facts. And what had tipped them off was I ended up using a travel agent from the pink section of the San Francisco Chronicle. It was every Sunday they had a pink section. I used a travel agent I found in there, which turned out to be a bogus travel agent. So what I stupidly, naively, you know, I was what, I don't know. 20, 20 years old, 21, I had bought a, I'd paid for what I thought was a return ticket and it was a one-way ticket. The They were, they eventually, the San Francisco DA eventually caught them and uh, I got some of my money back, but basically they denied my entrance. They kept my passport and they said, you have to go home. And so the next day, I bought a new, brand new ticket back to San Francisco, shortest trip to London ever, London Heathrow, not my favorite place now. And when I was at Heathrow, they frog marched me to the plane to make sure I got on it, I guess. And I stopped at the WH Smith store there, which is one of the kind of bookstore books and magazines and snacks and things. And I bought a magazine. And so I marched all the way back to the back of the plane with my Q magazine, which is a music magazine from the UK, and ended up sitting next to a guy called Neil. Now, Neil's a lovely guy from England, and he's going to Berkeley for a semester. So we ended up chatting all the way to San Francisco. At halfway through the flight, I kind of had a flick through the Q magazine, and there was somebody wanting a record in uh, Q magazine. And I'm like, I have that record. So I land, I give Neil my details, we start dating. And then a month or two later, this is like August, and a month or two later, I find the magazine again. And I pull it out. And I was like, Oh, I must write that guy. So I write the guy and it's now October time. And I get my first letter from the guy who is in Scotland. And we started writing the day I got the letter was Halloween. And I was off to see Morrissey with my boyfriend, Neil. 
And I got that letter from this guy, Nick, in Scotland. And I was like, God, I don't even want to go to the concert. I just want to write this guy, Nick, back. So it turns out that Nick and I become pen pals. And then Nick and I continue to be pen pals. And by February, we're expressing love, even though we've never met each other. And by June, we're married. And I moved to Scotland with my new husband. So how's that for a whirlwind romance? Holy moly, yes. So that, far? That, that is quite a story, Thea. <laughs> you never know what fate's going to do for you, huh? Yeah. That absolutely. is amazing. Amazing story. <laughs> so, fate, definitely. Uh, yeah, so I, I dumped poor Neil. But ironically, Neil comes up later in the story. So yeah, Nick had a better job than I did. And so I like to say that we flipped a coin and he won the coin toss. So I ended up coming here, even though he really loved America. But at that point, like I, once I got denied entrance and went back to the US, I did a course to become a travel agent, which I never actually used, but he had a better job because he worked in television. Okay, I'll move to Scotland, even though I'd only been to Glasgow for like two days in 1989. Like I knew nothing about what I was coming to, but hey, I had this new ready-made family. So anyway, I, we didn't last, unfortunately, but I did. And I remained friends with Neil. And at once my relate, my marriage ended, I speed rebounded into another relationship as you do speed rebound. And all this time I kind of kept in touch with Neil who's now living in Germany, by the way. And in, in 1998, I decided to publish my first book. And it was an 80s music trivia book called Essential 80s Pop Quiz. And I self-published it. it was back in the day. It was before print on demand, really. And it cost me about, I don't know, probably $5,000 to publish 3,000 copies of my 80s book. And Neil is the one that funded it. Bless his heart. And by the way, I still have several hundred copies if anybody wants one. I'll give them to you for free. You just pay the postage. So that was my first foray into book publishing, 1998, probably a little bit too soon to do, you know, an 80s book, number one. And, you know, we didn't really have the, the you know, the Amazon situation where, you know, we it was easy to be buying books so easily. So it wasn't a huge success, but it did get distribution across the UK into, you know, the WH Smith store that I mentioned and other bookstores and that kind of thing. So I think what does that takes up to? Sorry, this is a really long winded answer to how I ended up here. But I think I've answered several of the questions, I think, preempted some of your questions, I think, Cindy, but I guess what to go to next. So you have what's the next train of thought that we've got? Where are we now? We're 1998 book publishing, right? How's the internet? It's saying it's giving me an error. You sound fine on my end. Yeah, that's a great insight. I, I never heard of that story from you, even though we've talked many times. It was it's great to hear people, how they arrived to different locations. And then like you had mentioned, we're all from California originally. And I live right by Sonoma State in the town of Sonoma, California. So it was fascinating to hear that you went to Sonoma State and lived in my area as well. So that's really great. I want to welcome everybody that has been joining us. I see a few other, I see Vicki and a few other people that I can't always see their names, but welcome. Welcome to the Book Hackers Show. And we're interviewing Thea Nukova, and she's a verified global Canva expert. And we just were going through her information of how she got to live from America to the UK, which is so fascinating. And um, so I guess my question for you, Thea, is, this is kind of a little off topic, but what is your favorite thing to do in the UK? Since we're um, most of us are from America. <laughs> yeah. What I love about being in the UK is obviously Scotland's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. So I love traveling around the UK. And probably in the earlier days, I would, I literally, because my background was in radio, that's one of the things I did at college. My first job was in radio here as a presenter on a station just outside Glasgow in a place called Paisley. And the concerts, the music scene is my point. And I would go, literally, I could be at concerts three times a week. So I knew all of the bands and even the bands coming over from America would do my show like Smash Mouth or Hootie and the Blowfish or, you know, so 
it was, it's a wonderful place in Glasgow or Scotland in general. It's two degrees of separation, not six. Do you know, it's such a small country that there's usually a connection between everybody here. So travel, music, it's, you know, it's also travel abroad because, you know, I can be in Paris in two hours. Do you know what I mean? Or the south of Spain in four. So it's an amazing place just to be honest. So it sounds like everything's pretty close. You can travel and go many places totally. quickly. Totally. Great. And even trains, you know, even the train to France or to Amsterdam. Obviously, we need to go down into like somewhere like Paris to get to Amsterdam, et cetera. But yeah, very. it's a beautiful place to be. And with Scotland, you're only about 50 minutes ever from the ocean or the locks or something, you know, so it's scenic and one of my favorite things to do is to make travel journals about Scotland with photography and my own photos in them and stuff. Yeah, I feel really blessed to be here. And I'll kind of bring you up a little bit closer to a little bit more of the journey to get to some of the other books that I've done. So in uh, after the speed rebound happened, I went through yet another breakup. And in 2000, I met a guy called Christopher who said we dated very briefly i went on a trip to america i came home i gave him loads of presents and then that night after i just landed from america he's oh i could totally fall in love with you and i'm like oh how sweet and then he says but i'm thinking of becoming a priest mic drop okay well so we broke up <laughs> short-lived and after those three breakups i thought oh boy and so about three months later, on the 4th of July, I launched a website called so you've been dumped.com. And oh, there's some qu questions in the chat. I'll have to click it in a second, but I'm on a roll. So you've been dumped.com was a website and, a, and it was a community website. And I thought, really, this could be a great place for people who are going through breakups and divorces, whatever, where, you know, men, women, gay, straight, young, old. We had people that were teenagers and we had people in their 70s on this website. And I didn't really know what to expect, but it actually kind of blew up and I got press coverage around the world. I did lots of television and that sort of thing. And I became somewhat of a breakup expert, the dump chick, as it were. And so fa fast forward I'd started blogging in about 2001, 2002, and have been blogging pretty much ever since. And in 2010, my dad had a stroke and I ended up back in California and I was kind of struggling financially because even though the site was super successful in terms of traffic, monetizing it was something I never really managed. And it was a forum and I just could, you know, it should have made me a millionaire to be honest with you, but of course it didn't. And so, I kind of pivoted from blog to, sorry, forum to blog. And in 2010, on that trip to California, um, my dad had been kind of helping me a lot. And he basically was like, I just can't help you anymore. He had a stroke. He was struggling financially. And, you know, at this point, I'm a single girl in Scotland, nobody here, no family, struggling to make ends meet. And, it was a really tough time. And just as luck would have it, I got a message from a guy I knew through Twitter and through a bit of networking. And he said, do you want to do some work for me? And I said, oh, I'd love to. I'm in California, but let's meet when I get back. So we had a 15 minute chat and that was me hired. There was no interview process. I was immediately started. And that's in 2010. And one day he was going out to work to do some training. And he said, hey, Thea, you could do these trainings because all it was about how to build a website and how search engine optimization and trading online. And I'd done a lot, 10 years of that was So You've Been Dumped. And I'd been building websites since 1995. I forgot to mention that part. And so I'm like, trainer? Me? No, I don't want to stand up in front of people and train. Absolutely not. And then I went and watched him and I thought, I could do this. And so off the, you know, an off the cuff remark, and suddenly I have a new career. And I immediately started doing those, you know, it was a block of three half day sessions. And then it turned into I was doing Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and basic social media, and doing lots of these things for several years. And then in 2014, I was big into Google Plus, by the way, anybody better remember Google Plus. And I saw Guy Kawasaki and Peg Fitzpatrick, who were very big on Google Plus, and Guy had a 
a background with being a an evangelist for Apple. And then he became one for Canva. And I was like, what is this Canva thing? So in 2014, I signed up for Canva and I found it kind of hard to use. I'll be honest with you. I was like, I don't know. I'm using PicMonkey a bit more because it's a bit easier. And I met the founders in San Jose in 2014 summer. In fact, it was my birthday, July of 2014. And I walked up to their stand at bl the Blogger conference and I'm like, hey, I mentioned Canva in my workshops back in Scotland, but I kind of find it hard to use how to win friends and influence people by Thea Newcomb. And so I kind of, you know, I got to chatting to Mel and Cliff, who are two thirds of the founders of Canva and they're a married couple. And and after that, I was like, OK, I'll maybe give it a bit more of a try. But it probably wasn't until 2015 where I. I became a Canva convert. And what's funny is at the beginning of lockdown, I found a photo of me with Mel, the founder, co-founder, and I'm holding a sign that says, I'm a Canva convert. Don't even remember that photo, but I'm like, oh God, truer words have never been spoken. Because 2015, I went all in and it wasn't just casually mentioning Canva in my workshops anymore. I got asked, I got a phone call taking it back a minute. Sorry, I'm just rambling here, but I got a phone call. You're not getting a word in edgewise. Um, <laughs> well, it's good but, information for sure. But I did hear, it, it, now Canva started 2013, correct? It That's did. The one, so you were right at the very, I very was. beginning. Wow, that is, that OG. is fascinating. Yeah, OG. yeah. I probably started hearing about it around, well, I signed up February 19th. 2014. So it started sometime in 2013. Before that it had been a yearbook company. And I, you know, obviously signed up and I still have the email from when I first signed up, which is, it is Very old cool. school. Yeah. And then, so how did you become, and what, how did you become a verified global Canva expert? Like how did that, and when did that come about? I should say, but you know, what does that mean to the audience here? Okay, so getting to that. So in 2016, I began doing the workshops that were des special designated ones. So I became the first Canva trainer in Scotland. And having seen in 2018 that they had something called Canva Certified Creative. And it's it was an invite only situation there. And given that I'd had such a you know, an early start, I was an early adopter of it and had known the founders, I became one of about, I think maybe 300, 200 or two or 300. This is in 2018. I became a Canva certified creative, one of about 200 in the world. And so for several years, I was a Canva certified creative, but nobody really knew what that meant. And what was weird is like, we didn't have certification to become certified. So it was kind of a misnomer, to be honest with you. And then we finally got to do certification this year. They announced it kind of at the very beginning of this year. We're going to do a certification. They put us through our paces on Valentine's Day. We're going to let you know how you did, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we were all going to pass anybody that did it. And we're now down to 70 people that did it. So less than 100 of us in the world are now going to be officially, properly Canva certified. And then two days later, they're like, yeah, we're going to ditch the program. And we're like, wait a minute, you just had us do all oh, of this no. work. Yeah, <laughs> it was bad. It was bad, guys. So what they did come back with is they're like, okay, we are going to do, a, you know, a program and it's a beta program. And the and they came up with the name Global Verified Canva Expert. So there are 25 of us in the world. I'm the only one in Scotland and one of three in the UK. Again, you can't apply to be in it, not yet anyway. At some point, they may get to that point. But they're now trying to get to a level where you might start out as a Canva ambassador. So they have what's called Canvassadors in a couple of different groups. So there's a Canva design circle if you're more of a graphic designer, which I'm not. And then there's the Canva champions, which is if you're an affiliate, I, I don't know if you guys are both Canva champions, but that's kind of the starting point to eventually, I think it will eventually be that you will be able to be certified of some description, but at the moment, yeah. not. Yeah, I am a champion. I think Cindy is as well. Yeah, I am also. So you guys are on the path effectively and they'll, I think it'll change. I think they're really still trying to figure out 
what the best way is. And I'm one of the forerunners that is trying to create the certification program for Canva so that people can get some kind of certification. But it's a really a hard one because there's so many people and so many different uses of Canva that it could be VAs or it could be, you know, graphic designers that do print stuff. It could be print on demand people. Like, so how do you do a certification for Canva? and get it so that it's going to be the most relevant for everybody? Or do you have a couple different kinds of certification like you might with Microsoft, right? So, you know, you could do a Microsoft certification. Yeah, there's so very many different things that you can do with Canva that, I mean, some people are specialists in one area and some people in another area that that makes it hard to do a blanket <laughs> type certification. Thanks for listening. Join Cindy and Tammy each week for tips to help grow your self-publishing business. Don't forget to like and follow us on social media, as well as share with others who could benefit from our advice. Our website is bookhackers.us.